The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Have you ever sublet your house or your apartment? More specifically, I should say, your home? If you have, I hope it's been a pleasant and satisfactory experience. Because you know as well as I do all the horror tales you hear of people who are not so lucky. Of damage, breakage, vandalism, and non-payment. Or what is even worse, and to use the word advisedly, unspeakable. Which is what happened to David and Jane Francis. But that, of course, is the burden of our tale. Look at my floor. It's ruined. Well, what the devil is it, Dr. Wharton? I wouldn't invoke his name too carelessly, Mr. Francis. That is the goetic circle of black evocations. Goetic? It means, Mrs. Francis, pertaining to witches. <laughs> mystery drama, The Church of Hell, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Roberta Maxwell and Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Buick has some good news for procrastinators. Even though you've waited, you can still enjoy the comfort and luxury of a full-size Buick. Even better, your Buick dealer just might give you an irresistible deal on a 78 LeSabre right now. But do hurry, because a lot of other procrastinators have been waiting for this kind of news, too. Buick LeSabre. Yes, you can at your Buick dealers. Yes, you can. grow up, college is paid for, they're about their own lives, and a whole new vista opens out. You travel, you shuck off responsibility, but habit is hard to shake, and your freedom has limits on it. For example, to afford that European jaunt, you rent your house. And after the excitement and devil may care of the holiday, some doubts may swirl in. Doubts that in this case are much more Jane Francis's than her husband's, David. Doubts that normally would be minor, but not in this case. Jane and David Francis were not so lucky with their country house tenant. Not that they knew that as they were returning to their little apartment in New York. Ah, home sweet home. <laughs> Part way. Well, what does that mean? Our pied de terre, New York. Not home. Not home. Like I said, part way, not for real. In the country? What else? Your house, the house that David built. Yeah, but that's rented. I know. It, it paid for our trip to Spain. And wasn't it worth it? I hope so. Just the same. I wonder how everything goes up in the country. Well, that figures. You want to call now before we have drinks. Don't you think we should? Well, suppose something is wrong, a pipe's burst or something. Why spoil tonight? I mean, couldn't we just let all the problems wait for tomorrow? Why should there be any problem? Let me just make a call so it's off my mind. What's your poison, a martini or Manhattan? I'm still Andalusian-oriented. Don't we have a nice sherry? Yeah, your wish is my command. Hello, Francis residence. Who is this? May I ask who's calling? Yes, this is Mrs. Francis. What is it? Oh, forgive me, Mrs. Francis... This is Detective Lieutenant Harris Price. Detective? Uh, David, you'd better get on the bedroom phone. What is it, Lieutenant? Robbery? A fire? Well, no, it's a little more complicated. Uh, Mrs. Joanna Adams was renting your house. That's right. David, are you on? Yes, Jane. Uh, my husband is on now, Lieutenant. Go ahead. We've been trying to reach you for a couple of days. We were in Europe. We just got back. What's happened? Well, nothing really for you to be too alarmed about. Your neighbors had been calling us because there was some trouble about a cat. Oh, Tommy. Oh, nothing's happened to Tommy. Oh, oh, please. He's all right. Well, the cat is all right now. He was a raging tiger when we let him out, but he was just hungry. 
Uh, Pretty near starved. Poor baby. Well, has he been fed? Has Mrs. Adams skipped or something? Or something is more like it. I'm afraid I have to tell you that she's dead. Dead? How? We don't know that for sure till after the autopsy. Well, did someone break in or... Well, there's no evidence of that. It could have been a heart attack, perhaps. After all, she wasn't young. But, uh... But what, Lieutenant? I don't think that's something we can discuss on the phone. Would you have any plans to come up here? Of course. We have to get Tommy. Yes, we better drive straight up tonight. Well, fine. I'll be waiting for you. And <laughs> don't worry about Tommy. Ever since I fed him, we're buddies. Thank you, Lieutenant. See you as soon as we can. What do you suppose happened to Mrs. Adams? Well, search me. Heart attack, I guess, like the lieutenant said. He sort of hedged. Why didn't the lieutenant say it right out, if that's all it was? Well, what am I, honey, a mind reader? Well, let's get on up to the country and find out. <laughs> Here we are. Home sweet home. With more than one light burning in the window. Yeah, at least our detective friend is still here. Everything looks pretty good. The leaves have been great. Yeah, glad I painted the front last summer. Holding up pretty good. I see she kept mulching the vegetable garden with the clean garbage. Yeah, she was such a sturdy old lady. Hard to think of her gone. Oh, that must be the lieutenant <laughs> and Tommy. Yeah. Oh. Welcome. Hey, you're a smart cat. Hey, he's glad to see you. Well, obviously, you're Mr. and Mrs. Francis. Ah, you're Lieutenant Price. <laughs> That's right. Well, that cat sure is glad to see you, ma'am. Yes, he's not usually so demonstrative. Something must have scared him. Well, you go without food and water long enough, it's enough to scare anyone. How long? Well, about three days, we figure. Uh, your fellow there was howling up a storm. Shall we go inside? Uh, yeah, I'll get the bags later. Is Mrs. Adams still here? Oh, no, ma'am. She's been taken to the hospital. Hope you'll find everything in order. The boys tried to get everything back in place and clean after they dusted for prints. In order? Why? I mean, had she changed things around or something? Well, it wasn't that, Mrs. Francis. Uh, well, this room looked like a cyclone had hit it. Books dumped all over the floor, a chair turned over, and, and drapes and curtains all ripped down. Is this where she died? No, no, we found her in the upstairs bedroom. You said it was a heart attack. Well, no evidence of anything else so far. Yes, but if this room was turned topsy-turvy, you're not suggesting she did it. I don't think she'd have had the strength to do some of the things. So then someone broke in. Could be. You said there was no evidence of that. Oh, there wasn't. Well, I should say there isn't. Not that we've turned up so far. The windows were all shut, doors closed and locked... If anyone got in, he'd have had to have had a key. We didn't leave any extra keys. Well, Mrs. Adams had a set of keys in her handbag. Unless, of course, she had some maid. Well, why would she do that? Her husband's dead, and we understood she was all alone, no relatives. Well, still, there must have been someone else here. Someone in the house. You've no idea who it might have been. Not the slightest. Well, you don't mean some, someone might have killed her. Well, as far as we know now... Not in the strict sense of the word. What does that mean? Well, I'm, I'm not trying to be mysterious, Mrs. Francis. I'm really as much in the dark as you and your husband are. Except that I saw the old lady. I saw her face. And while I'm quite ready to accept the medical examiner's provisional diagnosis that she died of a heart attack, what I want to know is who or what caused it. Because I hate to tell you this. But in my opinion, that little old lady was literally frightened to death. Jane? Yes, David? For heaven's sake, what are you doing? I mean, can't you just dump the dinner dishes in the dishwasher? I did. Well, then what are you stacking them away for? Can't that wait for tomorrow? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm knocked out. I'm not doing the dishes. Well, why are you messing about in the kitchen cabinet? I'm, uh... Checking up on things. Our first night home from Europe. Can't it wait? I have a funny feeling it can't. All sorts of things are not... Uh, they're just not right, David. Oh, come on, Jane. Now, remember what the lieutenant said. I think he's been reading the wrong kind of mystery stories. I wouldn't sell Lieutenant Price short. 
come here. What? The dishes. Yeah? The everyday dishes. Yeah, the blue stuff? It isn't the same. What, what do you mean, it isn't the same? Just what I said. Every bit of it has been replaced. Same pattern, but it's all new. <laughs> That's crazy. How do you know? Well, look. Uh, the vegetable dish was cracked. Yeah. Three cups had chips. You know, you glued the, the meat platter yeah. back together yourself the night the night after the bet's party. Well, it's okay. A couple of pieces are replaced. No, uh, it, it just isn't a couple. It's a whole new set. Why? Well, you tell me. Because all or most of the other must have gotten broken. How? Well, things do break. I... Oh, a whole service for eight... <sighs> Oh, I don't know. Look at the cabinets. Mm-hmm. Well, they look pretty good. Someone's been polishing them. And... Hey, they're all scarred. And burned. I, I thought I thought she didn't smoke. Those aren't cigarette burns. There's something else. What? I don't know. Like, like something hot. Red hot, just brushed by. The curtains and, and the drapes in the living room are sort of singed. And you want to know something else? Every mirror in this house has been replaced. Except the one in the study. And that's cracked. More than that. Something so hot was against it that it melted the mercury backing. It's, it's all sort of fuzz, like it had been in a fire. Darling, what are you, what are you trying to suggest? I don't quite know. Look, come here. Let me show you something else. Yeah. Oh, where? In my spice closet. Uh-huh. Look at these. Huh. Uh, th- th- those, those are not your regular spice jars, are they? Dear? No, thanks. I never saw jars like these or uh, what they have in them. Hey, it looks like some kind of bugs. It is. They're beetles. And they're alive. This looks like a lizard skin, and I hate to think what these two could yeah, be. we'd better call the lieutenant. I don't think this is up his alley. Anyway, we all deserve some sleep first. I'm just about gone. I can't take any more tonight. Are you, you going to be able to sleep all right? Once I get to sleep tonight, it would take all hell breaking loose to wake me up again. <laughs> Sounds like what you said. What? All hell breaking loose. And it's some gale out of nowhere. Get this window closed. There. I'd better see what's going on downstairs. No, David, no. No what? I don't want you going downstairs. Please, darling, it's not worth the risk. What risk? It's just some crazy kind of storm. With no rain, no thunder or lightning. It's a storm. With all that wind, what else could it be? I'm scared to think. Something terrible is loose in the house. Something incomprehensible beyond our imagination. The same thing that frightened poor old Mrs. Adam to death. Please, darling. Oh, just hold me close. And don't question whatever it is that's happened. I have no touch of it. Whatever it is that's invaded our house means us no harm. But maybe if we just shut our eyes and ears. God, it will go away. Not the most pleasant of homecomings, nor the easiest of circumstances for landlords to find themselves in. Unfortunate enough to find that the lease has been broken by an untimely death, but how much more so to find that apparently an unwanted tenant has taken possession. A tenant that may be difficult, if not impossible, to evict. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Thank heaven for mornings. To wake up, no matter how sleepless or dream-ridden the night. To watch the sun rise again. Life renew itself. To know that this new day, whatever else it offers, is a promise. A promise that there is hope always for better things. Not that either David or Jane Francis are that bright and bushy-tailed. 
It is only that in the bright light of day, their explanations of the night before sound as fanciful and overdramatic as they are afraid they will seem to Lieutenant Price. David? Yeah? You awake? I'm awake. Did, uh... Was there really a storm last night? Or was that something I dreamed? Well, there wasn't a storm, as far as I can see. There was no rain or wind damage outside. Then it wasn't a dream. Some terrible thing was raging in this house last night? I don't know how terrible it was, but somebody really messed up the study and good again. I'd sure like to get my hands on him. Somebody broke in? No, I don't think anyone broke in. I mean, I, I, I think somebody has a key. Now, don't, don't worry. I called Lieutenant Price while I was downstairs. Just waiting for him to call back. You think something else is in this house? I think somebody could be hiding out. Some, some crazy guy. And you went downstairs all alone with no protection. I picked up the shotgun from the study. And, Jane, we are staying locked in this bedroom until the police arrive. I don't think ordinary locks are going to help us against whatever's loose in this house, David. What are you trying to say? You know, I don't think this is a real person. I think it's something from... from the other side of the grave. (laughs) You mean a ghost? I mean, that's ridiculous. (laughs) What would any self-respecting ghost have against a... Ah the voice of reason. That'll be the lieutenant. Whatever you do, get the police here fast. Oh, and ask him about Mrs. Adams, what the autopsy shows. All right, will do. Just take it easy, Jane. Hello? Yes, lieutenant. Yeah, just what I reported. Same kind of mess as before. Ah, no, no, we didn't hear a thing until it all started. First thing was the wind. Uh, I said the wind. (laughs) Well... It was blowing up a storm here, uh, enough to rattle every window in the house. Now, don't worry. We have ourselves locked in the bedroom, and we'll stay there until you get here. Uh, Oh, by the way, uh, did you get any results from the autopsy on on Mrs. Adam? Yeah? Yeah. The inside of her mouth and her throat. (laughs) What could have caused that? I see. Uh, But that wasn't the cause of death, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. We'll be waiting. Well, the police are on their way. What was all that about uh, Mrs. Adam and her mouth and her throat? She apparently suffered some first-degree burns there, also on her hands and on one side of her face. From what? They don't know. (laughs) Backfire from the gas stove, maybe? Maybe she used too much fluid on the charcoal boiler. I don't know, something flared up and singed her, but good. Enough to kill her? Oh, no, no, no. The medical examiner's first diagnosis was right there. She died of congestive heart failure. But what caused it? Well, that's something we don't know. Maybe it's something we don't ever want to know. Well, the boys and I have been over the house with a fine-tooth comb, Mr. and Mrs. Francis. And I can promise you that no forcible entry has been made into this house. Well, that's crazy. I mean, look at the shambles this place is. Someone had to get in. Doors and windows wouldn't keep it out. Someone else has a key. That's what it is. But why would someone want to vandalize our house? Well, not because of us, uh, because of Mrs. Adam. Well, what do you know about this Mrs. Adam? Not much. The agency brought her over, but... Uh, She had very good references. I mean, a couple of banks, a minister from some church, a letter from another sublet she had in New York. Mm -hmm. None from any place she'd worked? Oh, I I don't think this woman had ever worked. I mean... What Jane means is that she was loaded. Her uh, jewelry was worth a fortune. And her clothes were very fashionable. Hey, maybe that's what someone was after. Her jewel. No, I doubt it. According to the insurance policy we found, none of it seems to be missing. What does seem to be missing with the lady is her background. What do you mean? Well, although the accounts are very substantial, the banks have only carried them for a little over a year. Before that, she seems to have come from Germany. Well, that would be right. She had an accent. But very cultivated. Would you say that she was um, very religious? Well, I don't know. It's not the sort of thing you ask someone who's going to rent. I noticed there were a lot of books in the bedroom she was using on religious things. Uh, quite a few on theosophy, I remember. Oh, that's right. The letter from the minister. That's what he said he was. Uh, was his name Theodore Saxman? 
the minister? Uh, yes, something like that. Mm-hmm. Theodore Saxman was German-born, and he was connected with the theosophist movement, but no longer. You mean he's not a minister? Well, he got kicked out of the church. Why? Uh, we don't know that yet. The church doesn't want to talk about it, and we can't seem to find the ex-Reverend Saxman. But he'll be found. If the police don't turn him up, the insurance company will. Why the insurance company? Because he's named as benefactor in all her insurance. Something like a million and a half dollars in all. He was also named as sole heir in her will. Well, if there's that much money floating around, I don't think anyone will have to look for him. He'll turn up to collect. Unless her family want to fight the will. Well, apparently she has no family. And her husband died about five years ago. Well, then Saxman will turn up. Well, I'm not so sure. Why? Well, <laughs> policeman's hunch. I got a funny feeling he may be the ex-reverend in more ways than one. But if anyone has a key to this house, he's the logical one. I've got a lot of questions I'd like to ask him about the night Mrs. Adam died. You mean you think she might have murdered her? But she died of natural causes. Well, congestive heart failure is a result, Mrs. Francis. A lot of things can cause it. I'd like to know what frightened that poor woman before she died. You think it might have been something supernatural, too? No, 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 I didn't say that. I'm... I'm going to have a man on this house around the clock covering the front door. Uh, do you and your husband plan to stay here? For a few days till all this is settled, we hope. Now, why do you ask? <laughs> well, I'm just a cop, Mr. Francis. But I'm smart enough to know there's a lot I don't know. Uh, not, not that I buy, you know, something outside of natural things. Still... Well, for example, do these tools belong to you? Uh, no, no, I never saw the box before you, Jane. No, what's in it? I'll see for yourself. Well, a bunch of knives. What is it, a butcher's kit? I don't know. What's that funny-looking one with the little curved point? No, well, careful, Mrs. Francis, they're all razor sharp. But what are they? That's what I want to ask a friend of mine, Dr. Henry Warden. He lives just a couple of blocks from here. Say, would you mind if he came here and had a look at these and this room? No, I suppose not, but... Well, what kind of a doctor is he? <laughs> you see, I had a strange case involving a medium here a couple of years ago, and I met this guy then. Yeah, he's a real brain, I tell you. Even if he's... Yeah, well, you'll see for yourselves. He's what you call a doctor of parapsychology. What's that? It means someone who's an expert on ghosts. Well, I have examined the library of the, uh, the deceased. Small, but quite a comprehensive compendium of reference on the mystical arts, Mr. Francis. I would know, Dr. Wharton. It's uh, not exactly my field. Of course not. No, to be sure. Not everyone's cup of tea, of course. Still, ceremonial magic, the Book of the Dead, the Kabbalah. Cogliostro, fascinating reading for the inquiring mind. Why would anyone be interested in books like that? What would Mrs. Adam want with them? Was it something to do with her religion? Um, in a sense, perhaps. In a sense. Well, why did you want to look at the books first? I had my reasons, Mr. Francis. It's surprising what knowledge of a person you can glean from his reading habits and how books are treated can be a gold mine of information. May I see the room now where the psychic disturbances took place? Of course. This way. Uh, we don't know they were psychic disturbances, do they? I mean, it looks like pretty ordinary vandalism to me. But you can see for yourself. Ah, yes. Quite typical. Mindless destruction, it might seem. Drapes torn and... Let me see. Yes. Singed a little. Books destroyed, writs. But rather carefully selected books. The Bible, the Book of Common Prayer. Hmm. And teleportation. Classic, classic. Teleportation? Oh, yes, Mr. Francis. The desk, for example. That is oak, is it not? Yes, it is. Enormously heavy. Normally, it would take two strong men, at least, to move it. Well, it could have been dragged or pushed. Hardly. The rug has not been disturbed. 
It was lifted. Then there was more than one person? I doubt it. Well, he would have had to have had superhuman strength. Or abilities. Have you ever had a fire in the house? I mean, has the house ever been on fire? No. Why? The floor. You notice how the varnish is cracked and mottled? Uh, there are the same marks on the rug. I thought it was from dirty footsteps. That isn't dirt. They are scorched, Mrs. Francis. When you first came in the room, this strange particular odor must have been more evident, wasn't it? There was a sort of... Um, burning smell. Uh, not, not quite like a scorched smell. More like uh, ozone or sulfur, maybe. Or brimstone, perhaps. There were uh, some tools the lieutenant mentioned. Oh, yes. Uh, they are right here. Hmm. Yes. Mm. A remarkable collection. Quite magnificent in its way. Collection of what, Dr. Warden? Uh, the instruments required for the ceremonies of black magic. Black magic? Yes. Quite obviously, your Mrs. Johanna Adam was a practitioner of that dread and ancient art. What? If you don't believe me, help me pull aside the rug, and I think you will have incontrovertible proof. Dear me, as Dr. Horton might say, this is enough to start the goosebumps rising and the hackles on the neck. What evil, ancient, unspeakable discovery awaits poor, innocent David and Jane Francis as the rug is thrown back beneath their eyes? What secret obscenity does it conceal? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Over the years, you've learned that sometimes procrastination pays. So you shop for snow shovels in July, lawnmowers in December, and your Buick Regal now. Because you know that this is the time of year when Buick dealers may be even more open than usual to conversations involving deals. An elegant, luxurious Regal? Yes, you can. Right now at your Buick dealers. Yes, you can. looking down at what the rolled back rug has revealed. What they are looking at is a strange and cabalistic circle burned into the floor. Placed on it at 90 degree intervals are crude sketches of a skull, a goat's horns, a bat, and a black cat. Inside the circle, intertwining with each other, are four smaller circles enclosed in a triangle. Tacked to the floor, on the inside of the large circle, are strips of cloth or some animal hide. And everywhere within the circle, painted in black and blood red, symbols, strange gibberish words, and long, complex alien names. Look at my floor. It's ruined. What the devil is it? I... Wouldn't invoke his name too carelessly, Mr. Francis. That is the goetic circle of black evocation. Goetic? It means pertaining to witchcraft. So that's what Mrs. Adam was. A witch. Not quite, Mrs. Francis, or at the very most, a very amateurish one, who conjured up, or at least saw conjured up, more than she bargained for. Well, what does all that uh, circle thing mean? In the Middle Ages, that material all around the inside of the large circle would have been the skin of the victim fastened to the ground by four nails from the coffin of an executed criminal. Oh, how disgusting. Don't be too alarmed. I think you will find that this is only a simulation. As with the crude representations of what ought to be the skull of a patricide. Patricide? Someone who killed his father. The other three... Are the horns of a goat, a male bat drowned in blood, and a black cat who has been fed on human flesh. Are, are you serious, Dr. Wharton? About what I am reporting, absolutely. About whether I personally subscribe to this profane anti-religion, no. Most emphatically, no. But then you believe, as I do, that it's all nonsense. No, I'm afraid I don't. 
you believe that there has been black magic practiced here and that some kind of evil spirit has been set loose in this house? Let me put it this way. I know that anyone involved in the hidden church of hell knows there has. Let me show you something. I found these sheets in the back of a volume entitled Science and Physical Phenomena and Apparitions. They were written by Mrs. Adam, apparently. The handwriting can be checked. And they are a sort of confession and last testament. So may we read them? How's your knowledge of German, medieval Latin, and the litany of the grimoire? Well, I don't speak German or Latin. What's the grimoire? The grand grimoire is the last word on profane worship. The encyclopedia of black magic. The definitive handbook of sorcery. Okay, so we can't read the mumbo-jumbo Mrs. Adam left, but uh, would you read it to us? I won't read it. I'll tell you what it contains with... One stipulation. What's that? Lieutenant Price must be present and hear it at the same time. You mean you're telling me that Mrs. Adams confesses in that transcript to murdering her husband? In Stuttgart, February 14th, 1975. Did she stand trial? No. The medical certificate was issued as death due to natural causes. Well, what did she kill him for? She wanted to give a large amount to the religious group, a church, if you will, that she intended to join. He didn't believe in it. She felt she had divine grace to do as she wished. How awful. Did the church get the money? Not yet. Nor would it ever have. She changed her allegiance along the way. You see, she hadn't counted on her conscience. And at least for her, her husband refused to rest easy in the grave. He haunted her. Exactly. So successfully and persistently that he drove her to flee to this country, hoping to find freedom from his curse. And here she met a man named Theodore Saxman. Uh Uh-huh, the ex-reverend. The boy we've been looking for. Does he give any clue where we might find him? Oh, yes, indeed. Well, then I want it right now. I want to haul that joker in. Oh, I very much doubt that you can, Lieutenant. Now. What are you getting at, Dr. Warden? I don't think you're going to find Theodore Saxman in this world. Well, I sure don't expect to find him in the next one. I wouldn't be too sure of that. What? Let me explain, please. You see, I'm in a rather, shall we say, delicate position... We are dealing with two worlds, one of which all of us accept, the other of which I'm afraid only I do. Doctor, you've got something up your sleeve. What is it? Whatever it is, I assure you it is in your best interests, Mr. Francis. It is? I would assume you wish to go on living in this house of yours, that you'd like to be rid of this this poltergeist that is invading it. Now, just hold on. What's a poltergeist? Forgive me. A moment of levity. A poltergeist is a noisy, unusually destructive ghost. I'm afraid what we have here is a much more malevolent one. You mean it's it's the spirit of the excommunicated priest, whatever his name is? I'm not sure that that is the term of choice of his sect. Certainly, however, unfrocked and cast out of the church. Uh, what uh, What is it that you want us to do, Dr. Warden? Let me sum all this up first. A haunted and tortured Mrs. Adam fled to this country only to find out she could not leave the ghost of her husband behind her. In desperation, she returned to the church she had known, confiding in Theodore Saxman. He saw almost instant riches on the one hand and a sponsor to give him the opportunity to continue his experiments in black magic. They could not be conducted in a New York apartment. They needed seclusion and secrecy. This house was perfect for their plans. For what plans? Saxman's assurance to Mrs. Adam that he could conjure up the soul of her husband and persuade it under threat of being dragged to the deepest pit in hell to leave her alone. You're trying to say that's what happened right here in our study. I'm not trying to say. I'm saying it happened according to Mrs. Adams' last testament. Only 
Something went very much astray. Or what? She was not certain. She surmised, as I do, that he stepped out of the protection of his inner circle and that the soul he was trying to threaten, Mr. Adam, was released by the damned in exchange for the Reverend Saxman. Released? Where did he go? Back to the peace of the grave, I should say. So you're trying to tell us that this Saxman, even though he is dead, is still raging around looking for... Well, what is he looking for, Dr. Horton? At the moment, he is the most condemned of the condemned. A creature neither of hell nor heaven. An outcast spirit, doomed to wander eternity with neither hope of salvation or damnation. Unless... Unless what? Unless he can find a human body to die in. He tried to invade Mrs. Adams, but he frightened her to death before he had the chance to possess her. It is you, or perhaps even more, your husband, that are in danger now. Oh, no. You actually believe all this junk, Dr. Wharton? What I believe is beside the point. What people who have invested this house passionately and totally believed has poisoned it. I think those beliefs must be exorcised before either of you will be safe again. Well, what did you have in mind, Dr. Wharton? For the four of us, tonight, to occupy this magic circle. And after I have instructed all of you to raise this fiend from the darkness and consign him to eternal fires. I command and abjure thee, Theodore Saxman, to quit. Find a boat, wherever it may be, swearing that I will give thee one quarter of an hour alone. And if thou dost not come straightway hither and communicate with me in an audible and intelligible voice, dispatch me, Emperor Lucifer, or his messenger, Astaroth, in a human form, without either noise or evil smell, failing which, I shall smite thee all, and thy whole race, with the terrible blasting rod, into the depths of the bottomless pit. Yeah, it's crazy, but so am I. Anyone as crazy as me. If my boys outside knew what I was doing. Oh, silence. Don't move. Stay in your circles. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. I should never have allowed this. I warned you. If you leave the circle, you're risking your life. I adjure thee, O oh spirit. Come hither. And speak to me, else I will compel thee by the power of living God and by the Holy Spirit. Listen. What is it? Obey promptly or be eternally tormented by the power of the potent words in the grand clavicle of Solomon. unto me. One chance you have to redeem thyself. Abjure thy false master, Lucifer, and surrender thyself to the mercy of the true divine spirit. Cannot I cannot I am bound by 
Officer Dunn's bullet took him right in the heart. Just as well. I suppose this is Theodore Saxman. I think you'll find out it is. Oh, oh, how am I going to explain this at headquarters? Is there any need? The real explanation is right to hand. The man was armed with a knife. He attacked a police officer. And I'm convinced he was responsible for the old woman's death. So am I. But I doubt you'd ever be able to prove it. Dr. Warden, in the name of God, what really happened in there tonight? Whatever did, I think it was in the name of God. And I think it is best forgotten. Well, there it is. Which do you want to believe? That there was some hallucinatory drug in the heavy incense burning in that study? That Theodore Saxman did return to steal the jewels and lost his head and attacked the policeman? After all, he did have a key. Or, well, perhaps we'd better forget the other. If we find ourselves believing in goetic incantations, exorcism the clavicles of the grand grimoire and the power of black magic, who would sleep fast tonight? I'll be back shortly. It occurs to me that perhaps necromancy should not be dismissed so easily. It has a long history. And it does have its believers. After all, in 1 Samuel 28, 7 and following, at King Saul's request, the witch of Endor did call up Samuel from the dead. Or shouldn't I mention it? Because you might be listening to this in the late of night. Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Paul Hecht, Lloyd Batista, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.